Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where I don't want you to call this a comeback, so it's actually a revisit and upgrade of the GVP HD8. Today we'll look at upgrading this in a number of ways. The first thing I want to do is to replace the hard drive, as this is very noisy and worse, I've already had to open it up once to unstick the head as there are two rubber bumpers inside which slowly melt, and they get tacky and hold the head to them. So it really is only a matter of time before this drive dies completely, and what I want to replace it with is this. The Blue Scuzzy, or at least it will be once it's built. So while I get going on that, and yes I know my soldering skills are basic at best, so don't take any pointers from me, let's talk a little bit about the Blue Scuzzy which at its heart is the Blue Pill, an STM32 microcontroller based board. This has a very small ARM processor with RAM and space for a firmware, and it's very similar but not completely the same as an Arduino. This is then hatted on top of a board that has everything that is needed to connect a 50 pin SCSI cable. And with the right firmware on the Blue Pill, it ends up emulating a SCSI drive. The data is stored on a microSD card, and the whole thing is capable of emulating multiple drives at the same time. This isn't the only SCSI emulating device around. There's also the SD to SCSI, which has been around for quite some time. There is also the RAS SCSI, which is similar to the Blue SCSI, but uses a Raspberry Pi as the controller, and supports far more features. So why did I pick this one over the other options? Well, simply put, the price. This kit cost me £30, as I decided I didn't want to try and solder that SD card slot. But if you're happy with that, then you can actually get it a little bit cheaper, or you can pay £50 to get one fully built. Now, depending on which SD to SCSI device you buy, they're anywhere from £70 to over £100. The RAS SCSI isn't actually too bad, you're looking around about £40, but you still need to buy a Raspberry Pi to go along with it. Plus, it's a little bit more complex to build, and the kits currently only come from America. Now, there's one thing I haven't mentioned so far, and that's compatibility. So far, the Blue SCSI has been tested on older Apple hardware more than any other computer, and as of the making this video, I don't really know of anyone else that's tried using it with an Amiga, so this should be interesting. We will need to prep a micro SD card to go along with it. Thankfully, it just needs to be a FAT32 or XFAT formatted card, but you will need to make a file that will store the data on. Now, this is actually quite a simple process. If you're on Windows, just start up cmd.exe and type in fsutil space file space create new, and then give it a path. Then you just enter the size in bytes. So for 50 megabytes, it's 52,428,800 bytes. And once that's all been typed in, hit return and it will create an empty file of the specified size. On other systems, there are other command lines that can do this for you, such as DD. Now this file should then be copied to the micro SD card, and it needs to be renamed. The name must start with HD with the next value being the SCSI ID, which I'm just going to leave at the first ID, which is 0. The next value is the LUN, which I don't fully understand, so we can just leave it at 0 as well. Then we need to provide the block size, which I'm also going to leave on the default, which is 512. After that, we can add anything we like to help identify it, as long as the whole name is less than 32 characters long and it should also end with .hda. Now the extension in this instance means nothing, as the blue SCSI will just write the raw data into that file. So if it's used with an Amiga, it'll have the RDB information written to it, and if it's on PC, then it'll have the DOS partition tables created. So the file itself is just binary data. But the firmware will look for files that starts with HD and ends with HDA, so that's the naming format we have to use. And with the device created, we can now insert the micro SD card and test it out. Now, typically, you would need to flash the firmware to the blue pill, 
but this one arrived pre-flashed. So let's get it connected and boot up the GVP fast prep disk. And after starting up the software and selecting an option, we get a crash. Which really isn't a great start. This software wasn't known for being all that amazing, so instead let's use the Amiga Commodore HD Toolbox instead. Which I have on this 314 disc. Now don't worry, I'm not actually planning on installing 314 on this machine, but it just so happens to be one of the few installed floppy disks that I have that has HD Toolbox on it. Before starting the software, we actually have to change a tool type so it knows where to look for the drive. And in this instance, we need to change the SCSI.device to GVP SCSI.device. And with that done, we boot up the software and we can see it's scanning all the hardware, including our GVP. It detects that there's something here, but it doesn't know what to do with it. To fix that, we need to define a new drive type. And we can get it to read that information for us. Which reports that there's something missing. But it guessed what it should be anyway. Now this is most likely why fast prep died. But seeing it detected the size correctly and got the name, which is actually encoded into the firmware, I'm going to continue. Returning to the start screen, it now tells us that it's been changed and it needs to be saved out. But before that, let's quickly check out the partitions first. And as we can see, by default, it's created two of equal sizes, which is fine for now. So let's save out the drive info and the partitions, which should write out all that RDB information, which results in us getting an error message from the GVP SCSI device itself. Now I did try this a number of times, neither got this message or it seemed to hang writing the partition information out. Which indicates that these two aren't fully compatible with each other. It's not too surprising, as mentioned earlier it's only really been tested with Apple hardware, but thankfully it is an open source project and written in C++, which I just so happen to know. And after a bit of debugging and chatting with some of the devs on the Open Retro SCSI Discord, I managed to work out a bit of a hacky fix, which is sticking a delay at a set point in the code. Now the size of this delay was different depending on which card I used and the number of buffers I set. Now this isn't a proper fix by any stretch of the imagination, it is very brittle. So this really isn't ready for widespread use yet, so don't rush out and buy one unless you're willing to dig into the code. But fingers crossed we can work out what the core issue is and fix it to make it more compatible. But for the purposes of this video it's enough for us to give it a real workout. So after flashing this updated firmware to the blue SCSI, let's check out HD Toolbox again. And it partitioned it just fine. And after rebooting, we can see both drives and we can go ahead and format them. And while it formats away, let's think about how we'll install Workbench to it. Now I could install it from floppy disks like I did last time, but the fact is that this hard drive is just a raw file on a micro SD card, and that gives us more options. Which we'll get onto in just a minute, as the format is now done. And after naming the drive something a bit more useful than empty, Let's take the card out and put it into my PC and boot up WinUE. Now we're going to emulate an Amiga 500 Plus. And on the hard drive menu, we can add a hard file which will just point to the file on the card. And as we can see, it actually detects the partition information. Now at this point, I can use almost any version of Workbench that I have backed up. But for this, I'll continue to use 2.1 as it fits in with the timescale of this machine. Installing it using WinUI is a little bit faster than using real hardware, but the real upside is I can use these disk images that I know are clean and will work. And with the install done, let's check it out back on the hardware. And it boots first time and looks great. Now let's take this card back to the PC as using WinUI has some other benefits. I can easily install Directory Opus as it was legally released for free. 
but the version that's best for this machine was provided as an ADF file, which we can easily use in WinUI. And with a bit of copying, it's done and it's ready to be used. Another benefit is that I can actually point WinUI to one of the directories on my computer and it will show up as a hard drive on the emulated Amiga. And then I can use it to share software that I've gotten from places like Aminet. And as we can see here, I've got anti-click, sysinfo and a tools menu. It might feel a little bit like cheating, but it is so much faster than some of the other options. I had Amiga Explorer set up on the old drive, and with the Win98 laptop I could easily copy files to and from it with that. Now I did actually try to take an image of the drive as a backup, and it was going to take almost 3 hours to copy that 50 megabyte file. So um, I think I'll stick with using WinUI as that shortcut. With us now able to easily copy software to the drive, the big question is, how is its performance? Well, from a subjective point of view, it feels just as fast as the mechanical drive, but let's run a few tests just to be sure. The main test is going to involve copying files from the hard drive to the RAM disk, and then from the RAM disk back to the hard drive, so we get to see how its read and write speeds are going to be. And it's not just going to be a small file this time, it's going to be a whole game. And for that, I've copied Tiny Little Slug to both the Spinning Rust as well as the Blue Scuzzy. It's a little over 1 megabyte in size, so it'll easily fit into the RAM disk, so let's get the test started. I've written a small test script that will time everything that's going on, and here are the results. The mechanical drive on average took about 7.09 seconds to read, and it took 6.95 seconds to write it back. The Blue Scuzzy, on the other hand, took 7.2 seconds to read, and 6.97 seconds to write which puts the Blue Scuzzy in roughly the same ballpark as the mechanical. If you're expecting it to be massively faster, then you're going to be a little bit disappointed, as it's actually a little bit slower than the real drive, but it's not really by much. And it actually comes in around 180 kilobytes of transfer, which might seem a little bit lower than what we've tested before. But this time we were actually copying a game with a bunch of small and big files, so we actually got to see how well it copes with the Seeking. Now it's possible we might be able to increase these speeds by increasing the amount of buffers up, but that does also mean using far more RAM. So let's use another tool to give us an indication of what the speed is like, and for that we'll use Sysinfo. Which gives the Blue Scuzzy a result of around about 900 kilobytes a second. Now unfortunately, I tend to find sysinfo to be a little bit unreliable when running it from the hard drive. I think there's a few corrupted sectors on it that gives it trouble. I did test it a bunch of times, and the few occasions that I did actually get a result, it was just over 1 megabyte per second. But unfortunately, every time I recorded it, I got no results, which is just typical. So again, the Blue Scuzzy is just a little behind a mechanical hard drive. So going with this won't magically speed everything up, but with the lower seat times you might actually see some improvements. I know they are working on improving the performance, and using a faster card with XFAT might make things a lot better. But with the current state of the software, it also means I have to keep tweaking with the delays, which tends to slow things down again, and tends to level things out. So until we actually get a proper fix, this is the current state of affairs with this card. So when the Blue Scuzzy works, it is actually quite great. It might not set any speed records, and it's currently not a drop-in replacement for any Scuzzy drive, so don't rush out and buy one just yet, but this should hopefully change with time as we help the project out with more test hardware. And with that done, let's move on to our next upgrade, which is going to be RAM. Now the original plan was to take this up to the full 8 megabytes, so I bought 8 megabytes of RAM. Turns out that I bought two sets of 4 megabytes rather than two sticks of 4 megabytes. Remember, always read that full eBay description and not just the title. Thankfully, we can still use this to upgrade it from 2 to 4 megabytes. But that 8 would have been nice. So I'll start by popping out the current RAM, which isn't the easiest thing to do. I'm sure there's a better or more likely correct way of doing it. I could just plop the two sticks straight in there, 
but I do prefer to match my RAM where possible. And seeing I've got match sets, why not use them? And with the old ones out, the new ones go in quite easily and just click into place. Now this isn't a plug and play board, so we will have to change a few jumpers. Thankfully there is this helpful guide printed on the board itself which tells us we need to change a single jumper. And with that done, let's jump into Workbench, and it shows us the 4 megabytes in the info bar, so that's looking pretty nice. Now most games won't really use that much RAM, but as seen I'm planning on putting WHD load on it, it will be a little bit happier with all the extra we can give it. Now the last change I want to do is allow the HD8 to run without needing an external power supply, as the Blue SCSI uses a lot less power than the spinning rust, and because it doesn't really generate all that much heat we can also skip using the fan, so it should easily be powered by the system bus. Now based on what I've read it should be a simple case of soldering two pads and that's going to be CN5 and CN6 that needs to be bridged, which is easily done with a blob of solder across the contacts, being extra careful to make sure I don't short anything else out. Now time to cross our fingers to see if it works. And just look at that, no more need for a power supply, this will make using it so much easier. Now normally this would be the point that I'd close it all up, but with how useful it's been being able to take out that micro SD card and put it into the PC to add more software, I might just leave the cover off for now, or I'll work out a nicer way to access the card while it's all closed up. But I feel it's been way too long since we've played any games with this, and that's just going against the name of the channel, so let's go solve that now. As mentioned while installing the RAM, we also have the option of running WHD load. Now it's more commonly used on the Amiga 1200s, as they came with more RAM and the newer CPU that can help, but it does actually work on the Amiga 500 Plus. Now I've copied two games over for us to test. Now currently I don't have any of those fancy new icon libraries installed, so we don't get those cool looking icons. I'm not even sure if they even work on the 500 Plus, I'll have to check that out. Because as we can see with Donk, all we get is this small black square and after the info screen goes away, it actually boots up very quickly. And those load times are amazing, and we're very quickly into the game and getting absolutely hammered by everything. Now normally these patches are set up to save the game to the hard drive, but in this instance it's not been done so it still tries to save to a floppy disk, which is a bit of a shame. So if you want to play this one you will need to keep a floppy disk around if you want to save. It also seems the quit button doesn't work either, so if we want to go back to workbench we're going to have to reset the machine. This isn't the greatest game in the world but I am still a massive fan of it, and it runs just perfectly on this 500+. Which is exactly where I first played it back in the day, but just now, I don't need to get those floppy disks out. The other game I wanted to run is Rough and Tumble, which getting a box copy is one of my holy grail items. And as we can see from the splash screen, we can actually set it to use a two button controller. But I'm fine with up to jump using our joystick, so let's just stick with it. Now this is a little slower to load than Donk, but once it does load, it plays great. And that soundtrack, oh that soundtrack. I've been a fan of this game ever since playing a demo. It's a fast run and gun game that plays great from the hard drive. bored of it, then the quit button works as well and it'll just drop you straight back to workbench. But let's be honest, I just want to get back into playing it again. 
As this is still just an Amiga 500 Plus, it's still limited to running ECS or OCS games, so there's no AGA software here. And the games themselves won't run any faster, we've not upgraded the CPU or anything like that, though some will make use of that extra RAM, and might make it feel a little bit faster because of it. And while these upgrades were not earth shattering, they really do help extend the life of the GVP and my Amiga 500 Plus, as now I don't need to worry about the drive breaking down, and I can just run it without the fan so it's so much quieter to use, and now it's also much easier to get software to and from the machine. Though I will admit the Blue SCSI firmware does need some work, as I still get the odd hang here and there so I'll definitely be helping the team debug the code and trying to make it better. While the Blue SCSI might not be perfect, when it works it is pretty damn good, and thankfully the other upgrades we did on the GVP have been working great. So if you excuse me, I want to play a bit more rough and tumble. So until next time, I was the Gouldfish, that is a blue GVP, and this was Gouldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, you can let me know down in the comments, or you can use those buttons just below. You know the ones I mean. Or if you're not sure yet, then you can check out two other videos that I've done that are on the screen right now. So thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.